אוקיי, בעזרת השם, נעשה ונצליח. בעזרת השם זה loving kindness, we should be able to start, we're going to speak about today the concept of Eretz Israel, the Holy Land. What does it mean in Judaism? Why is it so important? And what does that mean to us? What do we have to do about it? What Rabbi Nachman of Breslov has to say about it? And maybe we're going to walk away for after tonight with a different understanding of this whole idea of Eretz Israel and what, it's, what it means. So simply, everybody knows it's a mitzvah to live in Israel. Everyone talks about living in Israel. You know, the, the famous, are we going to make Aliyah one day? Are we going to go and move to Israel? One day, it was at the Shem. It's a, it's a big life decision to make, and a lot of people put it off. You know, we're comfortable where we are. We're trying to figure our life out here. Imagine how much more difficult that it would be to figure out your life over there. I want to speak the language. It's a whole different culture. And uh, sounds like it's something that's above our pay grade. But at the end of the day, we have to learn about why it's important to try and make that effort. Not for no reason do so many people leave their life behind and start life in Israel all over again. There's a reason why. There must be something to it. So we, we have to find what it is. So Ritzak Breiter, which is one of the great Breslov stu uh, students of Rabbi Nachman, he says that every person should every day of his life be making an effort to go to Eretz Israel. Why does he make such a bold statement? He says, by doing that, you'll be able to tap into the complete, he says, complete holiness and a high level of patience. If you're able to get to Eretz Israel, we're going to see what does that have to do with anything? What does Israel have to do with holiness? And what does Israel have to do with patience? So we're going to understand that soon. The Gemara Masech Ketubot says, Gemara, says that whoever walks four steps in Israel, Arba Amot, he has already promised a portion of the world to come. Unbelievable. Just by walking in Israel, you already get a portion of the world to come. That's crazy. Why do you have such a great reward? This is what we're going to try to understand. So we know that one of the, the if not the greatest leader of the Jewish people, Moshe Rabbeinu, he prayed, the Midrash tells us, 515 prayers to ask Hashem to let him into Israel. We know he hit the rock and he got upset at the people complaining about the water. And Hashem decreed that he and Aaron can't go to Israel. But Moshe wanted to go so badly. There's the Parshat Bayit Hanan in the Torah. And he, Hashem, and he begged Hashem to let him into Israel. And Hashem said, if you continue praying, I have to answer you. And I have to say yes. So better stop praying because I made a decree already. You can't go to Israel. But we see Moshe Rabbeinu was dying to go. There's a reason why he was dying to go. So Renachman says that when you finally get to Israel, you get the label, you get the title called Mighty Warrior. You're called a Mighty Warrior. It's called you conquered and you went over many obstacles and you're called a warrior in service of Hashem. Why is that? He says that just simply, simply to get to Israel is very, very difficult. A person has to try and be willing to go through many obstacles and many, many difficulties in life to be able to move to Israel. Forget the physical obstacles. You're not here. You're not there. You're here, right? So you physically have to get a flight. That itself is a little bit of a, you know, work. And then you have to have money to be able to get there. You have to be able to have a house there. You have to be able to have a job there. You have to be willing to deal with all the different mentalities and different lifestyle choices people make there and the, and, and, and the culture there. And then on top of that, there's a spiritual aspect. Religion is different there. And Judaism is different than it is here. So you have to get used to all that. There's a lot of obstacles. So when you finally are able to get over all those obstacles, it's considered you're a warrior, that you're able to fight all these things, you're able to conquer all these things. We know Rabbi Nachman made a whole trip to go to Israel in the year 17, uh, 1799. It was by boat. In his time, it was by boat. And he imagined how much sickness there was and imagine how much suffering there was to go. And you know, it wasn't like, you just do everything on the phone, right? On the app and book your ticket and uh, have your boarding pass. Just, you have to know people. You have to know where you're going. You, they use maps and they had to really have a lot of skill to be able to get to the place they wanted to get to. And it took them uh, almost a whole year 
to go and almost a whole year to come back. He was there for a little bit. He was there for a Shana, the Chakim, you know, and uh, and uh, by the time he came back, it was already Shavuot. Was uh, so it was past Pesach. What? Yeah, to get from from leaving right after Sukkot, it took him all the way to Shavuot to get home. So that was like all the months till Pesach and past Pesach till Shavuot, all the way to get back. So we see how hard it is in his time specifically, and he still made a big deal about getting there. So he, when they tried to convince him out of it, and he said a very interesting line, and I want to point, point, take a point out of this line. He said, in the Sikhot Aran, he says that uh, his family told him, no, you shouldn't go. Don't go. Go stay here with us. Why do you need to go all the way to Israel? He said, most of me is already there. Now the, the minority has to follow the majority. So the majority of me is already there. So now my physical being minority has to follow meaning there's a concept that there's a person who's living in israel what does that mean you could be living there physically but we see so many jews who live in israel right now and are they considered living in israel like what we think in our mind living in Israel? what do you think a guy living in israel is doing he's living in the holy land he's probably learning he's probably doing a mitzvot he's probably uh you know in a, a, the most highest level of prayer talking to hashem in the holiest place in the world and what there's so many Jews who are totally doing the opposite of that in Israel, you know? They're, they're, they're doing whatever they want to do, and they're living the, the, life, the, the free lifestyle, and not, nothing to do with mitzvah. So are, are they considered living in Israel? In a physical sense, yeah, but spiritually they're not there, right? So Rabbi Nachman saying there's a concept of spiritually living in Israel also. There's a concept of, in my mind, I'm already living in the land of Israel. What does that mean? That means that, I'm, I'm, I'm dedicated towards Hashem and, and I want to get closer to Hashem and I want to find Hashem and I want to be living with Hashem. I want to be living in his land. I want to be with him as much as I can. And you could do that spiritually and mentally. And the last part is to add to the equation is being there physically also. But a person obviously has to have the other parts first. He has to have, I spiritually want to be living in Israel. I want mentally want to be living in Israel. And then the last part is I want to physically be living in Israel. Because like the Chinuch says, all the mitzvah we do, it's the outside is to awaken the inside. It's the outer to awaken a feeling on the inside. And a person could be living in Israel and totally miss the point. He's living physically in Israel, but the, the outside is not awakening the inner. And sometimes we have the opposite. We have the inner, but we totally don't have the outer yet. We're not in the land of Israel yet, but we have the inner. We're, we're awakened inside. We're, we're awake. We want to feel that feeling of living in Israel. Of living in Israel, we have that mentality of living in Israel already. It's a matter of trying to get, finish the whole picture, and that's what Rabbi Nachman was trying to do. So um, he made it all the way there. He was there for a while. He was there for the Chagim. He made it all the way back, and he said that everyone should make an effort to try to be there. Even just what he, what he did was he 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 went in. He was there for a little bit. He acquired that world, the portion of world to come that we spoke about. He walked in the land of Israel. He, the Gemara, we're going to see soon, the Gemara says in uh, Baba Batra that the air of Israel makes you wiser. Just being, smelling the air, breathing the air in Israel makes you wiser because Hashem's divine providence is strongest over there. Hashem's intervention in our lives is seen and felt the most over there. So that is the power that he wanted to tap into. That's what Rabbi Nachman wanted when he, when he went there. And it tells us that um, that the Rinachan tells us that the land of Israel represents it's it's anonymous is equal to the concept of faith and the concept of prayer. What does that mean? These things are all connected. He says in the seventh lesson of uh, Rikutim Maran. he says that when a person has a uh, has a lot of faith, how does he show he has faith? He prays. He prays to God, and he and he believes that Hashem could make a miracle for him. Hashem could change something. When I believe in nature, so I say, okay, it is what it is. Why should I pray? Why should I expect something to change? But when you pray for something that shows that you believe that Hashem could change it, and that you could believe in miracles, that something unnatural can happen. So that's the concept of faith connected to prayer. Their faith leads into prayer. And he says, but let's say you pray a lot, and Hashem hears your prayer, and miracles start happening. He says, that's when you tap into the power of the land of Israel. The land of Israel is the land of miracles. The Jewish people are people of miracles, and the land of Israel is the land of miracles. How, how the country of Israel was set up, and how they fought the Six-Day War, and how many wars they won, the War of Independence they won over there against so many countries. And people, till this day, 
you'll stop them in the street, religious people walking in Israel. You'll ask them, how are you making ends meet? How are you paying for your bills? And they'll tell you, with the grace of God, Chazdei Hashem, kindness of Hashem. It doesn't make sense. It's a miracle. I'm studying Torah all day. My wife works a little bit. I work a little bit. You know, this month somebody gave me a loan. This month somebody gave me a present. All of a sudden I got this, uh, you know, one-time job that paid for all my bills that one week. It's like not normal how many miracles happen. There have been stories where people just found a bag of money and just been able to pay their bills that way. These, this is the land of Israel that people, uh, there's stories of people chopping down trees and finding hidden uh, money in the side of a tree and people uh, finding an envelope on the street, you know, with money or people, uh, you know, just bumping into a rich guy and he say, hey, you need help. Uh, wait, wait, why are you crying? Why are you upset? And he just here, take a check. I'll help you. It's like crazy stuff happens there all because Hashem's divine providence is there. It's the land of Amuna. It's the land of prayer. It's the land where we come closest to Hashem. Because, don't get me wrong, it's difficult to live in Israel. It's very difficult to live in Israel. Hashem is very exacting over there. You know, the, the closer you are to the king, if you do a sin in the palace, it's different than if you do a sin in the courtyard or you do it in a far-off land. You know, you're in front of the king. It's more judgment over there. At the same time, in a sense, that's good. Because when you feel the punishment right away, or you feel the miracle right away, you feel very close. You feel you're close to Hashem. You feel you're very close to God. And at the same time, this is something we're lacking. Because if you're far from Israel, right? And you're, and you're, and you're in exile. So what do you see in exile? People who don't keep mitzvot, they have a lot of money. They, they, they have a free lifestyle and they have everything they want. They're living it up. And we are sacrificing for mitzvot and, and trying so hard. And it's sometimes we feel like, uh, who's hearing me out? Why is Hashem not watching out for me? Why am I suffering so much? But we have to realize that in the land of divine providence, the land of Israel, where you feel it the most, when a person does a sin, he's going to feel right away the punishment. He's going to feel I did something wrong. And when a person does a great mitzvah, a great miracle is going to happen to him. And Hashem, he's going to feel, wow, Hashem is right there. So it's a, it's, a, it's a closeness that sometimes we long to feel in, in exile that we don't have. We want to feel that feeling that Hashem is there. So this is what we said in the beginning. When you live in the land of Israel, you can get into this great, great power of patience. Why patience? It's because you'll be able to get over your anger. Why does a person have anger? It's because he believes that this is not supposed to happen to him. Why this happened to me? I'm upset. I don't want my life. And what happens? He gets upset. The Gemara says, anyone who gets upset to the point where he's willing to break something, about to break something out of anger, it's as if he's serving a Lord Zara. As if he's serving idols. Why? Because when you're so upset, what does that show? Hashem really is in charge of our lives. He runs every single point of our life. And what happens when he does something to us and we don't accept it, we get so upset about it. It's like we're saying to God, God, why'd you send this to me? I, I, I don't approve of this situation you put me in. You don't know how to run my life. I know better. This is not good for me. Look how upset I am. And it's as if you're serving someone else. You're serving yourself or you're serving something else besides for Hashem. Because if Hashem is who you serve and who you believe in, so why do not you believe in the situation he put you in? Why are you getting upset? So it's a level of Avodah Zara, so the Gemara says. But when you live in Israel and you want to live in Israel and you're, and you're spiritually living in Israel, you're tapping into the power of eternal patience and avoiding anger. Why? The land of Israel is where you have divine providence. You feel Hashem right there. You believe in Hashem so much. You did something wrong, right, right away, boom, something happened. You didn't guard your eyes, you got a dent in your car. You, you stole from that guy some money, right away, boom, somebody in the family got sick. You felt it right away, and you were almost able to put two and two together, and you felt Hashem was there. So therefore, you're never going to get upset. You're going to feel it. Hashem, I know, I realize, I understand why this happened to me. And then what happens? The same way, the other way around. You did this great mitzvah, and all of a sudden, Hashem fixed that debt problem you had. And you went out of your way to do something that was extraordinary and you didn't have to do. Right away, Hashem made a great miracle for you and set something up that you were waiting for for a long time. 
And you'll be able to put two and two together and you'll see Hashem is there. He does care. He is looking out for me. Hashem does do miracles. Hashem, we all the faith I had, this does pay off. And you'll be able to feel Hashem more in your life and you'll be less angry. You'll have more patience. You'll be able to live on the level where you know why things happen and you'll know Hashem is there. So he says, is that um, when we talk about living in Israel, it's about living there spiritually. The main thing is to be a spiritual move. Obviously, if you want to have the nicest house and the easiest life, Israel's not the place to do it. And it's a, it's a hard, hard, hard knock life, they say. But at the end of the day, for the spiritual gain, it's worth it. Why would you want to live in New York? There's so much opportunity here. And there's so many Jews here. And okay, it's expensive. Okay, the, the manners of people are different. Okay, you know, the, there's all the uh, negative parts that come with it, but it's worth it. You know, it's worth it. There's what the gain here. Same thing with Israel. Obviously, there's difficulties of Israel, and obviously there's the difference between here and Israel, but for the spiritual gain in itself, it's worth it. That itself is worth it. So at the same time, Rabbi Nachman teaches us also that it's worth it to go and try to be open to the idea of moving to Israel and trying to make the effort to move to Israel is because look at the end of times. The end of times, we're all supposed to go to Israel anyways. We all have to live there anyways. So we all have to come to the point where we're ready in our mind to move to Israel because you have to do that anyways in the end of the time anyways. If you really believe the Messiah will come, the Mashiach will come, and you expect believe that he can come every day and any day, so that means you'll be willing to accept the fact that you're going to move to Israel. That you're going to go and live somewhere else. That you have to be open to the idea also. So from that, like a guy says, like, you know, I have a lot of money now. I should build a house. I want to build a house. You know, maybe I should build it in Jamaica States. Build a nice palace for myself. You know, but at the end of the day, he really believes that uh, Mashiach could come any day. He has to be willing to say, you know, I might have to leave my house behind. You know, I might have to build a perfect house, but then Mashiach will come and uh, the Al Navi will knock on the door and say, "Okay, well, where all the Jews are going to and so now, are you ready to go? Are you ready to leave everything behind? Leave your BMW behind and leave your beautiful house behind and leave all the schools that you went to and all the work you go to that you love. You, you have to be willing to I leave. Is that is that easy? Yeah, right, right. A lot of people. People maybe people will ask. Maybe people ask, can I take my house with me? <laughs> you know, and." Um, we have to be willing to be open to the idea anyway. So you want to build a house? Might as well build it in Israel, no? Might as well invest in Israel. Might as well, we're going to go there anyways. But um, he says that uh, the land of Israel is the epitome of holiness. It's where we can free ourselves from materialistic views that the exile puts on us. You know, over there, when we're living in the land of Israel, mentally and spiritually and physically, that means... I'm living for Hashem. I'm not living for it to necessarily just build some house or just get some fame or make some money. That would be nice too. But my main thing is, my main focus is to come close to Hashem and I'll be willing to go through any difficulties to do that. And that, that includes living in Israel. And uh, if that's what the Torah tells us to do, and that's where Hashem is found easiest and, 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 and the best connection to Him is. So I'll be willing to do it. So Rabbi Natan says a beautiful chidush. He says that um, we are most, a lot of Jews are equal to, or maybe a little bit less than the Jews in Israel, but a lot, a lot of Jews, big percentage of Jews live in exile. Where they live not in Israel. And if really, if you think about it, you can have a very, very strong question. You can ask, well, if we, if the, if we can't serve Hashem in Israel, look at the Jews in Israel, not everyone serves Hashem. They're not close to Hashem. So how are we supposed to come close to Hashem in exile? If we can't do it there, which is such a holy land and such a connection to God, so how can we do it out of, outside of Israel? It's so much harder outside of Israel. So how could we have expected of anything? So Renatan says a beautiful chidush. Renatan says that you know what exile has over Israel? Is that in exile and outside of Israel, there's a certain appreciation that you can get for Judaism that you can't get in Israel. Not necessarily. Maybe you can, It'll take a little bit more effort, but it's easier to get it once you're outside of Israel. A lot, a lot of Jews who leave Israel, Israelis, they'll leave Israel, they'll come to America, 
and they'll be totally, totally chozer b'tshuva. They'll totally do repentance and become a religious Jew. Full-fledged, religious, praying three times a day, learning every day, doing a lot of mitzvot. He changed his life completely. Why? Because there's this concept of when you're very far, you start to realize how much you lost. You start to realize how precious even a little bit is, and you start realizing, I didn't pay attention to this before. I should have paid attention to this before. You know, when you used to be around mitzvot and tzaddikim and holiness and miracles all the time, you could get used to it. Just like the Jewish people in the desert, they had the man every single day. Imagine me and you, we got man. We would complain. <laughs> man is the best thing in the world. Falls from the sky, stay straight from Hashem. Why would he want it? But you get used to it. You get used to things and you start taking it for granted. You start. So when you're in Israel and you're around holiness so much, it's very easy to take it for granted. It's very easy. Okay, the kotel is the kotel. Like some Israelis, they'll speak to them. The kotel is the kotel. What's so special about the kotel? Like, okay, and so on. I went there a million times, you know. But when you've never been there, when you've never seen it, when you only hear about it and you go there the first time, you you start crying like a baby. You start seeing like, this is such a holy place. Like, I don't want to leave here. I, I feel so connected to God over here. I feel so connected to all the Jewish people. And then when you don't pray so much and when you're not around holy people so much and when you're not around miracles so much, like in the land of Israel, you see a miracle. You see a tzaddik. You pray a really nice prayer. You feel amazing. You feel connected. You feel like, wow, this is so for me. Wow, this is amazing. So that's why exile has a little bit of an advantage over Israel because you can't take things for granted so much and so easily over here. You'll become close to Hashem, actually, if you're here, in a sense. They say a saying that in Israel, the Shekhinah is in the, in the sky. The, you, you become closer to Hashem closer. easier outside of Israel than in Israel. Really? In a sense, in a way. Yeah. But if, you, if they say a saying in Israel, the, the Shekhinah, the heavenly, pre, uh, godly presence is in the sky. And and and, and uh, outside of Israel in America, they say the heavenly presence is in the floor, so that's easy to pick up. Anyone can come pick it up. In Israel, you have to be on a certain level to be able to attain it, to grab it. But in outside of Israel, it's very easy to pick up. Meaning to say, there's a big phenomenon in America: Jewish boys finishing yeshiva, and they go to yeshiva in Israel. They go for a year, or two years before they start college or after they finish the yeshiva, they're going for a bigger yeshiva. Before they get married, they go to Israel. And a lot of times they become more serious in Israel. A lot of times they become closer to Hashem in Israel. They change their whole lifestyle when they go to Israel. Why? It's because when they were here, there was only so much holiness they were attached to. And there was only so much holiness they were, they were familiar with, right? But they were looking for it, right? And when they go there, coming from America, coming from exile... They have a whole different viewpoint. Why is the Israeli yeshiva boy don't they don't just going to the Israeli yeshiva? They don't have this total flip in their life like the American guy does when he comes to Israel. When he comes to yeshiva in Israel, it's because they were in exile. They have this certain viewpoint in life, and they have this certain appreciation. They have this certain we were not so close to. We were not around these things all the time, and they have a certain like wow, I really want this. And then they go there and they see it and then they go, their, their neshama just upgrades. The neshama just goes all over the place like you're wanting to attain all these things, wanting to grow because in exile, you learn, you, there's a certain appreciation you get. There's a certain understanding that you get because there's so much lack of holiness here. So in a sense, exile is good. There's a reason why Hashem kicked us all out. We were in the temple, we took things for granted. People thought you could just bring sacrifices and you'll be forgiven for your sin. Oh, you you do a sin. It's okay. Do you'll do a sin. Just bring a sacrifice to the Beit Hamikdash temple, and Hashem will forgive you. It's okay. Everything's gonna be fine. And it's that attitude of like, okay, it's whatever, whatever, you know, and not treating it with the utmost respect. Sometimes Hashem kicks us out until we start realizing. You know, you take a little kid, and you say, go to your room. You kick him out, and you tell him until you don't come out until you realize what you did wrong. Then when you start realizing and appreciating, then you can come back out. This is what exile did to us. We didn't appreciate, we didn't realize what we have. So Hashem kicked us out. And in exile, we're like in timeout. 
we start realizing what we did wrong, we start realizing what we need, and we start realizing how amazing holiness is, how amazing miracles are. So he says, a beautiful, beautiful Kiddush. He says, what does it mean, Eretz Israel? That's how you say it in Hebrew, right? The land of Israel, Eretz Israel. He says, Eretz is from the root word uh, that shares the same root word as Ratzon. Or as Ratzon will. So what do you say, Eretz Israel? You know what you're saying? I want Israel. I want Israel. I want to be a Jew. Eretz Israel. I want to be a Jew. That's what Eretz Israel means. He says, so when, what, what does the whole land of Israel represent? Eretz Israel means it's the land where you are standing there declaring, I want to be a Jew, and Hashem comes, comes close with you. That's what Eretz Israel is. Obviously, there's people who live like that, even outside of Israel. There's people who are living like that right here in New York, in uh, Detroit, in Florida, in California, wherever they live. There are Jews who say, I want to be a Jew and I want to come close to Hashem. So in their mind, they're living in Israel. In the, spiritually, they're living in Israel. But the Rabbi Nachman says that the main thing is to finish the job and to be the holy warrior who finishes it and does the last part, which is the physical part. Physically living in Israel. It's not enough just to live spiritually in Israel. You have to want to be a Jew physically also. You know, Imagine the guy tells you, okay, put on tefillin. But I, I know what tefillin means. It's, it's the, the four partial that corresponding to our four senses, our eyes, our ears, our nose, and our mouth. We put the tefillin of the hand next to our heart, that our heart should be towards Hashem, and we should dedicate ourselves to Torah. I know all that stuff. I'll think about these things without putting the tefillin on. How about that? So he only has half the job. It's not he, he, The mitzvah, you only get rewarded if you physically do it, right? It's not enough that, oh, you know what the concept is. You have to physically do it. So the same thing over here. I know in your mind, we, are, we all want to be Jews and we all want to come close to Hashem. The Renachim is telling us and the Torah is telling us, the Gemara is telling us, Hashem is telling us. You'll only be able to fully cross the bridge once you physically do it. You physically live in Israel. So obviously there's a lot of difficulty. The Yitzhahar is not going to let us. He doesn't want us to live in Israel, right? And uh, he's going to make us look at Israel in a very bad way. People who know Israel or lived in Israel before, they'll tell you, you know how many bad people live in Israel and they sell pig in Yerushalayim and, and you can go to Tel Aviv and, you know, smoke weed and, and you know, there's uh, gay people with a gay parade in Tel Aviv and you could be totally not religious and nobody will bat an eye at you, you know, you, you could just get away with whatever you want and it's, uh, you know, and they could look at all the bad parts of Israel. And people are so stingy there. And people have no manners there. And everybody's screaming and fighting and, and rude. And, 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 and making a living there is so difficult. And the list will go on and on and on and on. And they'll mention to you all the bad parts about living in Israel. It's so hot. And it's overcrowded. And real estate prices are so high. And there's not enough jobs in the job market. I could go on and on and on. I heard it all. And what? At the end of the day, Rabbi Nachman taught us the concept of Zamra, of constantly seeing the good points in ourselves and in each other. He says, you also have to do that to Israel. You have to look at Israel with a good way and find the good points. And the Yetzirah will always spin so many things, so many different problems for you not to be willing to make that decision to go to Israel because he knows it's a big mitzvah. Rabbi Nachman says in the Kut HaLachot that Israel is like a fruit. What does that mean? Is we just had last week's Parsha, right? Last week's Parsha was the Etz Adat, the tree of knowledge. And Hashem gave us a test, right? He gave us a test to eat the fruit, not to eat the fruit. And what did the, what did the Nachash say? Nachash said, eat the fruit. But interestingly enough, what was the test? It was with the fruit. Why was the test with the fruit? Why would not something else? Because life, a lot of times, is like a fruit. What is the fruit? The fruit has a peel and has a fruit on the inside. A lot of times in life, you can get caught up with the outside, the superficial level of things. You get caught up in the money and the physical aspect of your life and the physical aspect of the situation you're going through. And you notice, Kabbalistically, what is the evil forces in Judaism called? Klipa. It's called the peel. 
the peels of holiness, they're called the peel. So, but then there's also the fruit part, the inner part, the, the meaningful part of life, the inner deep spiritual part of life and how life, life works. And he says, that's our test in life. The tree of knowledge, which was a test with the fruit is really the test of our life. Do we look at everything in a superficial way or do we realize there's something deeper going on? Do we just take the peel and be happy with the peel, which doesn't taste so good? Or are we willing to peel away? You know, sometimes kids, they don't like oranges. Why? I have to peel it. And I have to go and get your hands dirty. And oh, it's so annoying, right? Some people are like that. And they're not willing to peel away at their situation and realize there's something deeper going on because it's annoying to peel the peel. But we have to. It's a part of life. That's a test of life. Are you going to be happy with just the peel? Or are you going to be willing to work a little bit, peel it away, and get to the inside? He says you have to realize that Israel is also that. Eretz Israel, Rabbi Natan says, is also like a fruit. There's, yeah, but there's selling pig in Yerushalayim. And there's gays in Tel Aviv. And there's hard, it's hard to find a job in Israel. And the, the real estate is so expensive. And the people are so rude. And, 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 and there's so many reasons why not to move in Israel. But you know what all that is, Rabbi Nathan says? Just like the eight. That um, is, what? Just like the eight uh, people that uh, spoke uh, like Shogun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The spies, right? Mm -hmm. And you, that's all the peel. You focus, that, all, everything I just mentioned is the peel of Israel. You have to realize there's a big fruit on that side. You have to peel all that away. And you'll realize there's so much spiritual to gain in Israel. And there's so much clarity of mind to gain in Israel. There's so much patience and so much understanding. And, and people feel in America sometimes they know why bad things happen to them. Because they know what sins they did. And they realize it's probably because of this. I know why this happened. In Israel, that's a hundred times more how you feel that. And you feel sometimes miracles. I prayed. I did it. Bodhi dude. And Hashem, right away, he sent the salvation. Or I got a phone call right away after my voted to do it. And something, ha miracle happened to me. In Israel, you feel that a hundred times more. You feel Hashem is mamash hovering over you. And this is what you, 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 there's willing, you, you should be willing to give up everything for this. To feel mamash, a, a relationship like that close with Hashem. Because you physically live in the land of Israel. Yes, we know you could spiritually live in the land of Israel. Rabbi Nachman was known for saying, where, they would ask him, where are you going? He said, I'm going to the land of Israel. He said, everywhere I'm going, I'm going to the land of Israel. Meaning, I'm coming close to Hashem. Everywhere I'm going, everything I'm doing, I'm just trying to get close to Hashem. But the, the idea is to also finish the job. Not just spiritually be wanting to live in Israel. It's physically wanting to live in Israel also. Yeah. That's, the last, that's the last step. So when you do that, when you're able to decide, I really were willing to put up with all the difficulties and willing to put up with all the obstacles of living in Israel, that means you're you passed the you have the ability to look at the fruit of Israel, not just the peel of Israel. So Minachman wants to tell us that when you live your life and you're realizing more and more in your life that all the difficulties you have in your life, it's Hashem calling out to you. It's Hashem wanting to give you problems only for you to realize that you need him in your life. And many, many times we're feeling more and more divine providence in our life because Hashem is making a miracle here and making a problem here and us praying fixes it or us doing a mitzvah fixes it. And we're coming through all this close and close to Hashem. He says, you expedite this process and you become way more close to Hashem just by physically living there. So, a person should make an effort. They, the the, the Breslift teachers teach us a person should have a ready passport. A person should have a passport that's ready. What, would be, what a shame it would be if the time for you comes to go to Israel and you don't have the proper passport to go. You don't have the paperwork to go. People can tell you how annoying it is. You have everything ready. You have the house and you have the trip and you have the, the friends to go with and you have the flight and you have everything ready and it's just you don't have the paperwork for them to let you in how frustrating that feels how, yeah it's like you feel <laughs> you feel it you have it in your hand I know it that time. and you feel it you have you just like and you just can't have it and you just can't have it it's a tease it's a tease so how a waste it would be if you mashiach comes right now 
and everyone wants to go to Israel and you don't have a passport and you're stuck collecting documents and you're stuck waiting for your mom to send you your birth certificate and you're stuck waiting for the, the city clerk to send you a documents of mail that may take five to six weeks. And, and you don't know how many variables are on the way, to, how many ways the Yitzhahara has to block you. And if we don't put the first effort and if we don't make it a priority, it's never going to happen. So a person who wants to really decide, I do want to live in Israel, he's going to start looking for a job in Israel. He's going to start every day making connections to people in Israel. He's going to every day look, where does he want to live in Israel? He's going to start looking, how do I get my passport and my kid's passport? How do I get closer to people who know uh, American communities or know rabbis that are for me in Israel? And he starts looking into all these things. And, uh, and you know, and, and where does my family live in Israel? How, where can I be close to family? Or what area would I live in? Where are there Americans like me who want to move to Israel? How maybe, how can I apply for Aliyah? How do I make Aliyah? All these things. If you realize, you'll open up your eyes, there's like millions of things to go through. So many things to cover. But what, says Rabbi Nachman, when you're willing to do all these things and you actually do it and you get to the land of Israel, Rabbi Nachman calls you a mighty warrior. Because he says, not the hard part to live there. He says, the hard part is to get there. To get there, to step foot in it, to finally say, I got there. He's because there's so many mental obstacles, there's so many physical obstacles, there's so many spiritual obstacles that you to decide already. I, yeah, you're right. You know what? It's the tr- right thing to live in Israel. It's the right thing to do. You're right. Just to be able to admit to yourself that's true is very difficult. It's very difficult. There'll be a lot of people that might be doing. What do you mean? Why should I go? I'm comfortable here. I make money here. I have a family here. All my friends are here. All my family's here. Why would I ever want to go? I'll stay here. Yeah. And what happens? That's already one obstacle. And then to finally say, okay, maybe you're right. And then to find this, uh, make his heart agree. And he says, Rabbi, I know it's the right thing to do, but I can't convince myself. I can't even imagine living in Israel. Who's there? I feel like I'm going to sit in, in, with tumbleweeds and a cactus and, uh, and uh, scre- screaming, driving Israelis. Th- that's what I imagine in my mind. How could I ever live there? Rocks and rockets. Exactly. Hamas on top of my head. With Hamas with the hummus. So we have to realize that we have to slowly make that effort. Chip away, chip away, chip away until we finally believe that we have to live in Israel. And then not just believe that, we start making moves. We start making preparations. We start really praying for it because that's the main thing. The main thing is to pray. Everything in your life that you want to accomplish, Rabbi Nachman tells us, it's through prayer because everything is in Hashem's hands except for how much fear of Hashem we have. Everything from Rosh Hashanah was decided what's going to happen to us. But when can we break decrees? Through our prayers. Through our prayers. The only thing we break decrees. And we want to move to Israel. We want the Geula. We want the redemption. We want our, our personal redemption. It has to be through prayer. We have to pray Hashem. I should have money to go to Israel. I should be able to find a place to live in Israel. I should want to move to Israel. Hashem, right now, I don't feel like moving to Israel or I don't think I'll be happy living in Israel. Hashem, show me I'm wrong. Please convince me and show me and make me get to the point where I do want to live in Israel because that's what the Torah says. And that's what you want for me. And I want to believe and do what you want for me. I want to be able to the point where I really believe I want to live in Israel. And it's not a Tioni thing. It's not a state of Israel thing. It's the Torah says you live in Israel, so that's what I want to do. It has nothing to do with the government, it has nothing to do with the state of Israel, it has nothing to do with the Arabs, it has nothing to do with the prime minister. It just has to do with the Torah. It tells us Hashem picked a part of the world where He is more connected to, and you feel Him more there, and you become access to your full potential and your full spiritual power there. So that's where I want to be. And we pray for this every single day, every single day. And Mizat Hashem, I was very, very far from wanting to live in Israel. Even when I was married already, I was speaking to Rabbi Kalmus when I first met him. You would ask me, should I move to Israel? I would say, mm, I don't know, maybe yes, maybe no. I, living in Israel would be nice, but I don't really see it as a possibility. But slowly but surely, as I was learning more and more, I see that it's, 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 it's 
you're missing the elephant in the room. It's part of a huge mitzvah in the Torah to live in Israel. And the Torah talks so much about Israel. So how could you not live in Israel, you know? But at the end of the day, we said it's a long process. It's true. It takes time. And you, you have to believe in it. And you have to want it. And you have, there's a lot of variables. And you have to make all the possibilities work out. That's true. But then they, everything's possible with, with, with will. That's why we said the whole name of the country. Eretz Israel. I want Israel. Eretz is from Lashon Ratzon. The verb of, or the root word Ratzon. I want to be a Jew. I want Israel. I want to be Israel. Eretz. So every, in the whole name, it's Ratzon. It's will. If you have the will, you get there. You don't get there. And um, Rabbi Nachman went there when there was a war. He went there when Napoleon was, was conquering the world. And then people were scared to go on boats. There's a wartime. And it was a crazy story how he went. And he was Bikuch Nefesh. And he still went. His life was on the line. He still went. So especially now we see in America what's going on. People in this time feel the least secure they ever felt in their life in America. People from this generation, you were born 1980 onwards. You felt America is the best place in the world. Maybe if you were from communist Russia, maybe if you were from a different country that was unstable, immigrant, you knew what it's like to live in a country that was unstable. You knew what it's like to run away from governments and all that stuff. But if you were born here and you live here all your life, you feel like, where am I going? This is comfortable. I live here all my life. Right now, <laughs> recently, people feel the least stable. People losing a lot of money. People see the politics, the riots, people the virus. People start seeing that life is not what they thought it was. All these things they believed in is not as uh, stable and not the truth as they thought it was. And when people started, you asked Nefesh to Nefesh, the, the organization that's in charge of the Aliyah process. They said that during COVID, March, April, there was the months that they saw the most applicants in, in one or two months. It was the same amount of applicants that they had in one year. One year, one year's worth of applicants they had in one or two months. That's how many people wanted to move to Israel during that time. So we see how deep down, when the when they say you know when the stuff hits the fan, right? When everything starts going crazy, what's everyone's gut feeling? Oh, we gotta go to Israel. Be out. <laughs> we gotta run away. We gotta go to the Jewish homeland. Problem is. We have to get to that feeling right now before all that stuff before happens. Before it gets bad. Before it gets bad. We have to believe that that's the real thing, the right thing right now. And when it gets to that crazy moment to fix things in an orderly way, forget about it. Organization is going to be in a war time, in a crazy time to try to get papers and to try to get uh, things a plane, in a plane. Uh, forget they about it. Get there they don't let you go to the forget about it. Forget about it. So, Rabbi Nachman says, pray for it. The Mishnah of Pekavot says, Im lo achshav, e not If me. not now, so when? And if not me, then who? So, a person has to pray, pray, look at the fruit, not the peel. Realize there's a lot of spirituality. Living in Israel is about the spirituality, not the physical part. You understand? And don't get caught up in all the bad parts about Israel and all the people who live there. You, either, you don't live with everybody in Israel, okay? You, they say you marry the girl. You didn't marry the family, right? So you married the land. You're not marrying the people. You, understand? you find your neighborhood. You find your family. You find your group of people. You find your rabbi. And you stick to it. And you connect to Hashem. And you're going there for Hashem. You, you'll be willing to, to deal with all this nonsense because you know you're coming close to Hashem. And, and Hashem is so worth all of that. Yeah. And you remember... It's Eretz Israel. I want to be a Jew. And where do you can be the Jew the most is in the land of Israel. Hashem should bless us with Amen. the ability to go to Israel, to pray for to go to Israel, to pray, to be able to get over ourselves and get over all those problems to get to Israel. Hashem should bless us with the redemption very, very soon. And we shall all be in the uh, Eretz Israel. Yerushalayim. Amen. 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 Right now, downstairs. As I were. What's my name? <laughs> <laughs>
What did you must say? Mm -hmm. You just said you wanted to say with me, no? Played enough today? You didn't play today? You didn't play today? When did I come home? I was feeling good for two days. Then I came home at 7.30. You were still playing. That's disgusting, Shell. You have no limits. Not you, not your sister. You would be on the iPads and this thing the whole day. You're ignoring me, Nahon. I'm going to tell him, uh, that's it. I'm not going to be like this. No reading books, no nothing. I don't know. 